So just to um, make everyone aware, this is a recorded meeting on Zoom, obviously. Um, and we're here today to talk about the comprehensive corridor analysis and some preliminary redesign concepts for um, a wide variety of intersections. Uh, we call it Walker's Brook, but it's certainly well beyond that. And um, so the uh, idea here is to um, have this meeting so that we can allow our consultants from Green International to present some of their findings and then um, open it up for public comment and feedback. Um, we're going to stop at 6.30 and uh, certainly we're, that doesn't conclude the project. The project will um, certainly be open and uh, likely uh, there would be an, another public meeting to follow. Uh, that could be at the select board meeting. I think we're still working out the logistics on that. But um, I wanted to welcome everybody and thank you all for joining us today uh, on this beautiful day. And thank you for taking the time to um, hear about where the town is at with the effort to um, engage consultants, uh, the traffic consultant Green International to assist us with um, some forward looking ideas and um, for those of you who um, are neighbors, and I, I see names and faces that look familiar, um, when we went through the Eaton Lakeview 40B process, um, that was a, a long process, uh, but a good process, and one where we worked very closely with neighbors, and I think that made for a, a much improved outcome. So um, start off with that as a, um, a good springboard for what we're trying to do today. And that is uh, take what we talked about all those months ago, um, years ago, and um, really look at this, uh, this holistically. And that was the word we kept referring back to. And, and, and again, that was something that the neighbors brought to our attention. So it was a, a great way for us to listen to what the neighbors were concerned about and not just react with, um, with, we had lots of conversations about um, some reactionary ideas to, well, we'll just do this or we'll just do that. And the, the comment we heard loud and clear was, let's take a comprehensive look at these intersections and really come up with a holistic plan. So that's where we're at um, as far as Green International came on board after we got through the 40B process. Uh, we did get a um, payment from the developer to assist with the cost, and that was very helpful. Um, and so the streets that we are uh, going to hear about tonight are Walker's Brook Drive, Ash Street, John Street, Washington Street. Uh, we're going to see a little bit about some of the connectivity that we talked about and uh, connectivity uh, from these areas to downtown, to Lake Quinnipowit and the various commercial areas. Um, so again, this is really just a starting point for implementing future design, engineering, and infrastructure improvements. And we wanted to lay this foundation and get really get feedback on some ideas. Um, as a reminder, this is a recorded Zoom meeting. If you are not speaking, we would ask that you please mute yourself. Um, more than happy to have you unmute when you would like to speak. Um, but the way we're going to go at this is we're going to have the consultant uh, led by Wing Wong from Green International uh, do the presentation, which is also posted on the website. Um, and then we're going to break for uh, question and answers and, and public exchange, public feedback. Um, if you could please use the raise hand function on Zoom, we would appreciate it. And Andrew McNichol, the staff planner, um, is going to be working the controls and um, organizing us in a way that we can um, get to your questions through the raise hand function. Uh, the chat function is another option if you're having difficulty with raise hand or if that's easier. Um, but the raise hand is our preference. And um, as I say, this is just really one conversation we're having. Please do, don't feel like this is your only opportunity to be heard. We're always available on email and, and other ways. Um, Andrew, is the, his email address is on the website. But I also wanted to introduce my other colleagues from Town Hall before we turn it over to the consultant. 
Um, Julie Mercier, the Community Development Director, is with us tonight. Um, Aaron Schaefer, the Economic Development Director, is with us. And Chuck Tyrone, the Conservation Agent, is with us. Um, we also, of, of course, Andrew, the Staff Planner, Andrew McNichol. Um, and he's your contact if people want to email. Um, the DPW Director, Jane Kinsella, is here. Uh, Christopher Cole, the Assistant Director of DPW and Ryan Percival, the town engineer. And there are a few phone numbers, so I apologize if I've missed some other staff. Um, but with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Wing Wong from Green International. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Jean. Um, my name is Wing Wong. I'm with Green International Affiliates. Uh, I'm the Transportation Planning Group Leader. Um, with me today is Jason Galvin. Uh, he's been the project engineers for this study. Um, so he'll be making part of the presentation as well. Uh, the beginning part of our presentation, for those of you who attended the Economic Development Summit, uh, this is going to look very familiar because that was the initial work that we did. Um, so I apologize if some of the stuff is old, uh, but I felt that it's important that we repeat what we found in the beginning and then we use that to basically um, develop our concepts as we move forward. And we have had several meetings uh, with town staff on these concepts as well. So, um, so with that, I'm going to um, start. I will try to share the screen. Um, now you should be able to see the first sheet of the presentation. Everybody see that okay? Great. Okay, so now I will go. Um, so today in, in this meeting, uh, I'm just going to go over a brief project history and how we got here today. Um, as I mentioned, the first few slides are, are, are repeated info from last year, but um, traffic counts, uh, some of analysis results, I, I want to share that with you. Um, the accident data that we did collect um, and review where the trouble areas are. And then we get into the concept stuff, which are, are all brand new um, to the neighborhood group. Uh, we first will start off with the Walker's Brook Drive corridor. And then Jason is going to start talking about the Main Street and Ash Street, as well as the John Street corridor and also the Washington Street corridor. Uh, and then we'll just wrap it up for questions and what the next steps might be. So from project history, a lot of you are familiar with it, uh, the Eden Lakeview Apartments. Um, we were we brought on board for the town has uh, the traffic peer review or reviewer and has part of the review, we identify quite a bit of um, mitigation that could potentially be performed at the Lakeview at Walker Brook, uh, Walker Brook Drive intersection. Um, you know, as Jean mentioned earlier, the, the word that was thrown around a little bit was the holistic study approach to a, a bigger area rather than just, okay, we look at this one intersection, um, this is what we're going to do, but take a look at um, an overall view and see what else can be done and does it make sense to do that in, uh, in regards to the surrounding area. So um, since then, uh, at that time, that review, we worked very closely with the town staff and developed the scope, which basically is, um, uh, this is the end result of that. Um, a brief recap of the project history. Um, on this particular map, 95 is on the right-hand side. Uh, Lakeview um, apartments are roughly in this little area right here. Sorry, right, right in that little area there. Um, all the circles are the intersections. Uh, we call them study intersections. Uh, these are the areas where we either took new traffic counts or we had traffic counts from um, the Lakeview apartment studies. Um, so those are the areas we looked at um, relatively closely. Uh, so in terms of overall traffic, uh, some of this might not be a surprise um, to you folks. Uh, Walker's Brook obviously uh, sees the most amount of traffic, around 24,000 uh, cars a day. Washington Street also shouldn't be a surprise, carries just over 8,000. Um, what is a little bit surprising is John Street, but we did hear from the neighborhood group when we did the peer review that John Street um, have been, or has been used as a cut through traffic, a cut through route. Um, so certainly the 3,500 cars a day uh, reflects that condition. Uh, and then last but not least, we also took traffic counts on Ash Street. Uh, it also currently carries about 3,000 uh, cars a day. And all these counts were um, taken back in 2019, uh, so all before COVID. Um, I would assume at this time all the traffic volumes are, are a lot less than what um, we used to see. So this is a quick uh, just recap of the level of service, which is um, something we use to 
um, evaluate traffic performance. Uh, so it has the grades of A to F, A being the best, F being the worst. Um, the three periods that we study were the AM peak, uh, the PM afternoon peak, as well as the Saturday midday, uh, especially given uh, the commercial properties on Walker's Brook, um, certainly Saturday is a period of interest. Um, as you can see on um, Walker's Brook itself, you actually see a lot of A's, B's, uh, even C's. Um, from a traffic engineering standpoint, uh, anything in an urban area, even, even down to an E, sometimes might be an acceptable level of service. Um, so as you can see here, we actually get fairly high marks in terms of um, level of service. Now that's because Walker's Brook is a four lane roadway. Um, so in the analysis, it certainly shows up as having a lot of capacity. Um, certainly we'll get into you know, deficiencies later on regarding uh, Walker's Brook itself, but at least from a traffic analysis standpoint, it seems like everything is operating at a very acceptable um, condition. One area that we did find operating level service F, E, is the Washington at Main intersection. Uh, so we go into a little bit more uh, on that, and Jason will, will describe some of the options that we saw at that particular intersection. Um, elsewhere, um, John at Salem, as well as um, uh, Eden at Salem, uh, those were operating, um, again, uh, acceptable level. Um, certainly want to point out that there are some Fs here um, for the left turns, uh, normal because Salem Street does not have um, stop sign controlling them, so the only analysis that it produces is the left turn lane. Uh, in that case, that is uh, an F, so I want to point that out. Okay, we also looked at uh, craft summary. Um, so these are numbers that we have shown up here, but um, we also looked at what's called a crash rate, uh, which provides a better indication um, whether or not there's safety uh, concerns. So um, on these, you see that we highlight a few intersections where um, uh, there's, there's a high total of crashes, but we also did look at the crash rate. So you might be wondering, um, you know, how come you know, 16 crashes at this particular location it isn't being flagged as red. Um, crash rate is, is, is a better indication because it relates the number of crashes into the number of cars heading into a particular intersection. Um, so for example, 10 crashes uh, in an intersection that sees say 10,000 cars, uh, the crash rate might, might be very low because of high amount of cars. Now, 10 crashes in a location where it sees only 10, uh, 1,000 cars, now that's a much bigger concern. It would result in a much, uh, much larger crash rate. Um, so the three locations that we really um, saw as a, as a problematic area, uh, as you can see, there's, um, there's one on Walker's Brook, uh, obviously uh, Washington and Maine, as well as the Ash Street. Um, so probably not a surprise to those of you who drive this every day. Um, Pedestrians and bike crashes is something that we also looked at as well. Um, the red dots are the pedestrian crashes that were noted and the greens are the bicycle crashes that we did note it. Um, they are scattered a bit all over the place. Uh, one possible reason may be because some of the um, streets that we study just don't have uh, pedestrian or bicycle accommodations. And so therefore you might not see as much um, usage. Um, so maybe that's why they're scattered a little bit more, um, but once I think the improvements are made, it's very possible that we will see higher usage. Um, so therefore, it's very important that we improve the safety aspects um, and accommodation of these locations. Um, so with that, I will now go into uh, the conceptual designs that we looked at for the Walker's Brook um, corridor. And just a quick recap on the deficiencies along this corridor. A lot of it um, is not a surprise uh, to most of you, lack of bicycle accommodations, um, not a continuous pedestrian accommodation, um, left turning vehicles at key intersections to Market Basket, Home Depot does not have left turn lanes. Uh, it's all the through, all the through lanes. Um, certainly some outdated uh, equipment for uh, signals as well as um, lack of ADA compliance. So. Um, none of these, again, sh uh, should be surprising, um, and we're hopefully that the options that we came up with will, will fix uh, most, if not all, of these deficiencies. One of the first alternatives that we looked at is what's called a road diet. 
um, what a row diet does is it takes the existing uh, footprint of the row and it converts it uh, converts it to be smaller in terms of uh, vehicle accommodation and utilize that converted space to better enhance accommodation for other uses. So in this particular case, Walker's Brook is a four-lane row. We would take one of the lanes away um, and turn it into a, a sheer left turn lane. As a result, for vehicles, you would mainly see two through lanes and then the center, turn, um, center sheer left turn lane. With that reallocation, it provides enough space for us to add two buffer bike lanes, uh, one for each side. And then we, we would still be able to provide by, uh, pedestrian accommodation uh, with normal sidewalks on both sides of the road. Um, so in this particular option, it certainly accommodates all users from that standpoint. Um, there are certainly uh, advantages and disadvantages of it. Um, the advantages obviously improves bicycle safety, in, uh, increases pedestrian safety, accommodation, uh, certainly um, provides a better connection overall from, you know, could, uh, from the downtown to Lake Q. Uh, now, some of the disadvantages you might um, come to mind immediately is traffic. Uh, with this particular option, it will increase traffic congestion, um, certainly going down from a, a two lane for each, for each direction of travel down to one lane is going to add congestion. Um, uh, so that's probably the biggest uh, uh, disadvantage to this particular option. Uh, also, Walker's Brook carries about 24,000 vehicles a day. Now that is on the upper threshold um, for roadway that um, may or may not be a candidate for road diet. Typically, um, a good candidate would be around 20,000 or less. Um, so, but uh, not to say that projects um, uh, have uh, perform road diet for roadway that carry more traffic than 20,000. There's certainly uh, examples uh, elsewhere that have had success uh, converting a road with, with 24,000 uh, cars a day. Uh, but that's just something to keep in mind for this particular option. Um, we have some cross sections here shown to the left. I have some uh, example pictures, which will be on the next slide. Um, as you can see on these slides here, um, again, the center turn lane is now gonna be new provided. Those two lanes gonna be converted into one, and then there'll be one lane for each direction of travel. Um, bicycle accommodation, again, provided on both sides of the road. The little um, uh, white, uh, hatch lines there, those indicate the buffer, um, uh, which enhances uh, bicycle safety for, um, uh, for the bike lane. And then the sidewalks are on either side. Uh, we cut several different cross sections here just to kind of um, show you what it, it would look like in each segment. Um, they're pretty similar uh, for these three segments. And then um, the locations north of General Way would basically come down to be a tooling uh, row, which is um, very similar to today. Uh, here's some examples of uh, row diets and what it would look like after a project is completed. Um, as you can see in this particular picture, um, the shared, shared uh, left turn lanes will be in the middle. At certain intersections, they actually do convert it to um, uh, what you would normally see as a dedicated left turn lane. Uh, as you can see, the, the bike lane is now added. Uh, in this picture, it doesn't have the buffer, but in our case, we can certainly add some kind of buffer, such as you can see in this particular picture. Um, this is an example, um, uh, an urban area where uh, planters would use, um, has buffer. So there are many options with what the buffer could look like. Uh, so these are certainly just examples. Um, and then at intersections themselves, um, bicycle, um, these, are, these are called uh, bicycle turn uh, bike boxes. Um, and those could be used to sort of enhance um, that bicycles are present uh, along the roadway. So that is alternative one, road diet. Alternative two, we took a different approach and wanted to still provide uh, accommodations for pedestrians and bicycles, but sort of leave the traffic piece uh, more or less alone because again, it does have a high volume of traffic on Marcus Brook. So what we uh, proposing an alternative to is proposing a share use path. And again, I have sample pictures in the next slide. Uh, a share use path basically will combine both bicycles uh, and pedestrian traffic onto one side of the roadway. Um, this particular path will be wide enough um, so that it can accommodate both. 
Um, in our um, review, we looked at uh, what makes sense to have the share use path, which side of share use path it should be on. Um, and we decided that south side or the, or the west side of Walker's Brook appears to be the better side um, to have uh, the share use path. So again, same cross sections, roughly the same sections as the slides you saw before. Um, the four lanes of traffic is maintained, but I'll explain that a little bit. Um, and the share use path again is on either, if you want to call it the south side or the west side of uh, Walker's Brook. Now the travel lanes here, uh, even though it's four lanes, under um, this particular alternative, we would still propose to actually add dedicated left turn lanes um, for all those key intersections because it does it is warranted and it certainly would improve safety uh, for vehicles. Um, it's something that uh, we would certainly suggest to do. Now on the advantages and disadvantages, uh, it looks like there's a lot more disadvantages in alternative two relative than um, relative to alternative one. Uh, some of the bigger dis uh, disadvantages is really involves uh, right away impacts um, because we will need the space to build the share use path. Um, unlike alternative one, where we're taking space from the existing roadway footprint, in this case, we're keeping the existing roadway footprint and we're just adding to it uh, in terms of the share use path. So um, as you can see, the disadvantages here, you know, certainly utility poles will have to be relocated, um, as mentioned, Right away, easements and or takings will be needed to, to um, add uh, this share use path. However, um, the advantages here, um, I would think that this is actually would be even greater because again, uh, pedestrians, bicycles are both gonna be off the road. Uh, they're gonna be away from traffic and we would still allow um, for efficient vehicle flow, um, very similar to today, except it's gonna be even safer with the left turn lanes. Um, and certainly, usually when we do the share use path, we would propose a uh, buffer, um, and this could be a landscape opportunity or streetscape opportunity, um, having this buffer between the row and the share use path. Um, so then certainly increase um, an opportunity to improve aesthetics, uh, whereas alternative one did not have that opportunity because again, we're keeping everything within um, the right of way. So those are the, the, the two options um, that we came up with for Walker's Brook. Uh, for share use path, here's some examples of them. Um, certainly you can see the green buffer from the row and then the wider path that uh, accommodates both uh, pedestrians and bicyclists. Um, as you can see, this one would probably be very, very close to what Walker's Brook could look like um, given this particular picture. Um, it does have four lanes, we have the buffer, and here's the share use path that can allow for both um, uh, uses. Um, so the next, uh, as we move up uh, along Walker's Brook, um, the next intersection, and um, it was off high interest, it was the uh, general way as well as um, uh, Lakeview. Um, so I'll get into that here. Um, so a lot of these deficiencies we heard from when we uh, um, was performing the peer review, uh, peer review, uh, Lakeview F um, currently is not signalized. It's not part of the signal that is located at General Way. So we certainly heard a lot of concerns about that. And we certainly had concerns ourselves when we were doing a peer review. Um, a high number of conflict points certainly results from that. Um, and and <clears throat> if we, start to look at um, what happens to John Street, this is a location that we really want to be careful because, um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, when we did the peer review, um, we were sort of focusing what happens here. But if we start to branch out and look at what happens to John Street, and if we, um, if we wanted to uh, try to minimize the number of cut through from John Street, well, there's going to have a direct, that's going to have a direct impact on this intersection as well. So we're taking all those, um, uh, all those issues in, into account as we looked at um, what the options could be at this location. Now I threw this up here. Um, these are uh, the different working files that we had as we uh, prepared all the different alternatives here. And we actually presented this to the town staff and, uh, and we all in agreement that, hey, let's show this to the neighborhood group to show you all the different options 
uh, different layouts that we did look at at this particular intersection and how we ultimately arrive um, at the suggested uh, alternative. So, um, you know, one of the easier ones that we talked about uh, potentially doing is just simply signalize the lake view, incorporate that into the intersection. So certainly that is one option on the table that we looked at. Um, we heard roundabouts. Uh, certainly that is one thing that we looked at. Okay, what happens if we do a roundabout here? What kind of impacts would it, would it be? Would it even fit? Um, so certainly you can see that you know, just a single lane roundabout, um, it certainly can fit, but it does have substantial right of way impacts uh, to these two particular properties here. Um, and, and, and this particular property actually divides um, part of it is owned by the Market Basket Plaza and part of it is the private residence uh, property here. Um, and this particular one here, we're getting very close to um, the residential house. The bank would also be impacted as well. Um, so we're trying to, when we lay these out, we, we try to do our best to minimize impacts. And in the case where we can't avoid impacts, we try to um, minimize impact as much as we can for each property. So we're trying to uh, find a best fit place as much as possible. So that's how we arrive at oops, sorry, this particular location. Then we started really thinking outside the box, okay, what if we have two small roundabouts? Um, how does that fit? Does that fit? Does that work? Um, so as you can see the bottom three here, okay, we have a roundabout here. What if we do that, take advantage of the wooded area there, um, but it doesn't really con connect well back to here. We said, okay, all right, well, what if we move it up um, to be more in line with the existing roadway footprint? Okay, that works, but then that's gonna be a lot of impact to the bank property. Um, okay, so maybe that's not preferred. Um, and then finally, okay, what if we make a really small roundabout here and how would that work with truck, trucks, um, delivery vehicles uh, to the plaza itself? And so we looked at all those different scenarios um, in here as well as we even kind of take a look at, okay, what happens if we put a quote unquote peanut type of roundabout, which has been done in different locations um, out there and does that fit? Um, so at the end of the day, we, we, we felt that we took what we thought would be the best options left. Um, and that would be a single lane roundabout as well as um, the signalizing option of Lakeview. Um, uh, now all these two each does have advantages and disadvantages. Um, so we listed them here. Um, I'm not going to read through every single one, um, but the key points here would be, let's just start with the roundabout. Um, as mentioned, the right-of-way impacts um, certainly are great uh, on all corners of the roundabout. However, it does um, make it safer for the intersection as a whole. Um, Lakeview is now going to be part of the overall intersection, so they will have their own approach to exit or enter. Um, the bank itself, uh, certainly we can reconfigure the driveway and we can maybe um, take them out of the equation, if you will, so we can make it um, one less conflict point, one less approach into the roundabout. So we feel like there is a potential option we can make that work. Um, certainly the drive at General Way, that is maintained. And with the roundabout, left turns can be made uh, coming out of General Way from the Market Basket Plaza. Um, uh, however, like I said, the biggest uh, disadvantage of this would, would be the right-of-way impacts. Um, so we went back and looked at the signal options again. Okay, what, what are the disadvantages of just signalizing this? Um, if we just simply added a signal here, uh, we would introduce another face to the intersection. Uh, certainly would make it uh, less, ef less efficient from a traffic operation standpoint for the overall intersection. Uh, safety would be improved for Lakeview, uh, certainly. Um, but again, uh, the uh, uh, reduction in, in efficiency is certainly something that um, we wanted to avoid as well. So we came up with this partic particular option is what if we eliminated the bank drive um, and relocated the bank drive such that it exits out to Lakeview uh, and by doing so it takes away one particular phase um, that we have to, uh, one less war, uh, conflict points that we have to worry about has the signal we would still signalize Lakeview, uh, but essentially what we're doing is moving the bank lake to the Lakeview. Uh, um, so we believe that that would uh, resolve some of the efficiency concerns that we had, and while still providing uh, the safety um, 
that is desired out of Lakeview. Um, and certainly there are some right away impacts that will have to be uh, addressed and resolved with the bank uh, in particular. Um, but we felt that this is a, a best compromise while still meeting the goals um, to improve safety uh, while maintaining or not losing efficiency uh, here at this particular intersection. Um, so with that, I will now actually turn it over to Jason, who's going to pick up from Walkersbrook and on to Washington Street Corridor. So Jason. Sure. Thanks, Wing. Um, so yeah, as Wing uh, just went over the Walkersbrook Corridor, um, so continuing along that corridor and going into the downtown Reading area, um, you know, as part of the holistic study, we wanted to look at improving multimodal connectivity um, from the downtown Reading area all the way down to Lake Q, um, which the main corridor is, um, as everyone knows, Walker's Brook. Um, but Washington Street does um, provide that direct connection from downtown to the Walker's Brook corridor. Um, this corridor, the characteristics of the um, Washington Street corridor are very different from Walker's Brook. Um, as you saw in um, the traffic volume summary that Wing uh, talked about, Towards the beginning of the presentation, Washington Street only carries about a third of the traffic volumes per day that Walker's Brook does. Um, the cross section is um, narrows down from a four lane roadway cross section down to a two lane. Um, much more rural characteristics, all residential adjacent land use. Um, so in trying to, you know, as Wing said, we looked at um, adding buffered bike lanes along Walker's Brook. Um, and also a shared use path. We wanted to continue that bicycle connectivity um, from that, you know, either the bike lanes or a shared use path into the downtown um, Reading area. Um, and looking at several different options, um, you know, we looked into the existing roadway was about 22 to 24 feet wide. So um, you, it would require some significant roadway widening um, to get the width that we would need to um, add some bike lanes or a, a shared use path on one side of the road um, to complete that, you know, separate bicycle accommodation connectivity all the way to downtown. Um, we, we did look into that widening. Um, unfortunately, on the south side of Washington Street, it is lined with utility poles. So widening to that side um, would require um, probably some land takings and also relocation of all of those utility poles. Um, to the north side, there's just not enough space um, from the existing edge of road um, to widen out. Um, you would be cutting into the frontage of all the adjacent land uses, um, all the residents' properties there, um, limiting their driveway space, their frontage. Um, so at the end of the day, after considering, considering all these different options, um, the best um, and most practical bicycle accommodation that um, we, we could think of, um, you know, and propose at this time was uh, the, shared, the shared lane markings that you can see um, on the roadway cross section on the bottom picture here and then also on the top of the image to the right. Um, you know, what these sharrows do is they, they are placed within the middle of a travel lane. Um, so bicycles do share the vehicle travel lanes um, with vehicles, um, but it does alert the vehicle drivers um, that bicycles are present and sharing the lane with them. Um, it can identify a bicycle route um, and it can be installed in conjunction with signs that could further alert drivers to bicyclists sharing the road. Um, and it also does reduce the, um, the possibility of a wrong way cyclist. Um, it gives them the direction of that they should be traveling along the roadway. Um, the separated bike lane, um, as I said, would need significant widening of the road and um, would result in significant um, cost increases as opposed to just the shared lane markings here. Um, now going from the Washington Street corridor right into the downtown area, um, as Wing noted on his, um, one of the slides that showed the, the crash history and also um, traffic operations, this, the intersection of Main Street and Washington Street was identified to be both a high crash location and a poor level of service um, location as far as traffic operations go. Um, one of the, the main reasons why and that we saw in the pet tra crash patterns from the crash data 
was there were a lot of rear ends and angle crashes here. Um, these, this um, intersection here, the main street approaches both consist of two, two lanes, um, but there's not a designated left turn lane on either approach. So, so each left lane is a shared through traffic and left turn traffic lane. Um, there are also not protected left turn phases at this intersection. So all left turns have to yield to oncoming through vehicles. Um, so this could be both a contributor to rear end crashes. You know, if a, if a person is traveling behind a left turn vehicle and the left turn doesn't have their blinker on or um, the person behind them just isn't paying close enough attention and um, they, the person turning left has to yield and come to an abrupt stop to, through traffic, um, this could cause a rear end, tra uh, rear end crash. Um, and then also if a left turn gets impatient, they could try to find a gap in traffic that's maybe not sufficient and um, they could, there could be angle collisions that are caused due to that as well. Um, the poor operations, um, there are the main street, particularly the northbound movement in the PM peak hour is a very heavy movement. Um, I believe there's over 1200 entering cars just from that northbound approach during the PM peak hour. Um, so this results in poor operations um, during the, um, the PM peak hour, but also we saw LOSFs during the AM and Saturday peak hours as well. Um, and then um, the, the existing traffic signal equipment there was, is um, very outdated. Um, you don't have the, um, the back plates with the retroreflective borders around the, the signal heads to increase the visibility there. Um, pedestrian signal equipment was seen to be relatively outdated. Um, so as we saw all of those deficiencies, uh, the improvements that we, that we identified um, was to reconfigure the lane configurations along the main street approaches. Um, so instead of the southbound approach being in existing conditions, a shared through right and a shared through left, uh, we were proposing to reconfigure that to be a shared through right lane and then a left turn only lane. Um, what this will do is give left turns their own lane and it could give us some signal phasing and timing options to allow these left turns to be a protected um, movement. Now what that also allows us to do, um, as we now only have one through travel lane in the southbound direction, um, the receiving existing conditions, receiving southbound side here is two lane section. Now since we only have one through lane on the approach, we only need one receiving lane here. So what that allows us to do is increase the number of travel lanes on the northbound direction from a two lane approach to a three lane approach, accommodating a new exclusive left turn lane in the northbound direction that will align with the southbound exclusive left turn lane. So now both northbound and southbound approaches will have protected left turn lanes and potentially phases. Um, it also allows for a through only and a through right lane in the northbound direction, adding capacity, which in turn um, improves traffic, traffic operations in addition to um, the safety at the intersection. Um, in addition to the safety and operations improvements, um, we are also propose, we would propose to modernize the traffic signal equipment. Uh, this could entail adaptive signal equipment so that the, um, the, contro the signal controller and the uh, signal operations itself can adapt in real time and adjust to different demands and traffic flow as they, um, you know, as they shift from one time of day to another. Um, this, we would also propose to replace all the existing signal heads, you know, have the signal heads that have the back plates with the retroreflective border tapes to increase visibility of those signal heads, um, add your signal heads for your protected left turn movements, uh, the countdown features for the pedestrian signal equipment, things of that nature. Uh, so as I said before, a main goal of this study was to improve the connectivity and specifically multimodal connectivity from downtown Reading area to Lake Q. Um, so the, the most convenient and uh, main connection that, will, that you can see here is highlighted in green. goes from downtown Reading Main Street here along the Washington Street and Brooks Drive corridors down to Lake Q. Uh, we did look into potential off-road multi-use paths that we could connect somehow from the Lake Q area down through into the downtown. 
Um, but the location of 95 and the amount of private land takings that would uh, be entailed here um, made that a very, uh, you know, those were significant hurdles that we would have to uh, get over to complete that off the road uh, trail path connection. We also did briefly look into, you know, maybe if Walker's Brook, if it's, um, you know, if we could go down maybe a less vehicle traveled road, less volume, would Ash Street be a potential? Um, but Ash Street, as you can see, kind of goes down where my cursor is here, all the way down and connects somewhere down here. Um, it's not a very convenient route. It takes people, especially if you're walking or biking, um, a significant um, way out of you know, the, where you're intending to travel to. Uh, so what we settled on was uh, the Washington Street and Brooks, Walker's Brook corridors. Um, the goal here would be, as I said, to enhance the multimodal connectivity. Um, as we found, there are no uh, bicycle accommodations along Walker's Brook or Washington Street. Um, the ADA, there was lack of ADA compliance um, along those corridors as well. Um, and that's, you know, those are all, all things that went into our potential alternative improvements along these corridors. Um, so another intersection that we looked into close to the downtown Reading area was the Main Street and Ash Street intersection. Um, as I'm sure a lot of you that travel through this area on an everyday basis um, are aware this is a, um, the intersection is kind of a mess for lack of a better term. Um, you have the commuter rail at grade crossing right across Main Street and Ash Street. Uh, you have a very long pedestrian crossing across uh, Ash Street here. Um, you do have a high number of vehicle conflict points where you have you know, all of the commercial driveway openings, um, the, the McDonald's opening here. There's a lot of access points to off, you know, off street commercial properties um, within a small area. Um, there are, there is a lack of bicycle accommodations here as well. Um, a lack of connectivity from a pedestrian traveling along a sidewalk on Main Street to the existing sidewalk on Ash Street. Um, this, this whole area here does not have pedestrian accommodations. Um, and there, the existing ADA, um, the existing ADA out here is not, not compliant. There are no ADA compliant curb ramps. Um, and as you can see, there is a, um, it's tough to see in this image, but there is a painted island along the Ash Street approach here, but that um, does not provide a sufficient and safe pedestrian refuge for pedestrian crossing across Ash Street. So as you can see on the right here, um, while we were out in the field, we did notice a, um, an, elderly, an elderly woman crossing that street. Um, and it would have been nice for her to have a, you know, a safe, refuge here so she could stop midway through the crossing if she needed to um, and also um, just uh, shorten that crossing distance for her. Um, so those were some of the deficiencies that we saw while we were out there. And going off of those deficiencies, um, some of the improvements that we identified, we tried to split them up into um, short term slash midterm and long term improvements. Uh, now, these are all relatively speaking, so some of these may not seem so short term, um, but as you will see later on, they are relatively short midterm compared to the longer term improvements that we'll go over later on. Um, so the first uh, intersection improvement alternative we looked into um, was realigning Ash Street so that it, um, it meets Bolton Street in a four way intersection here. Uh, along the private driveway that leads into the back of the Market Basket Plaza off of Walker's Brook. Um, so the private driveway here would have free flow all the way to Ash Street. Um, you can see we're tightening up the corner here along the northwest corner of Ash Street and Main Street, which would reduce the pedestrian crossing distance here. Uh, we would propose to carry the existing sidewalk along the east side of Main Street around the corner that would eventually come down and connect to the existing sidewalk on Ash Street with a crossing here to connect to the other side of the sidewalk. Um, it provides a nice four-way intersection with Bolton Street here with Ash Street. It is a more defined intersection, less driver confusion. 
um, and you know drivers would then be able to access exit Ash Street or Bolton Street here and have a traditional three-way intersection um, with Main Street here. Uh, under the disadvantages of this approach, um, you can see that you know Ash Street, which could be a higher traffic volume approach later on in the future, depending on what happens with the um, Eastern Gateway District Redevelopment Study. Um, this is now a stop controlled approach as opposed to existing where uh, they have a free movement to get to the Main Street intersection. Um, there's a short distance here between the stop bar on Ash Street right here and the rail crossing. So there's only space for about one vehicle in the queue. Um, and it does have some minor impacts, as you can see, to the existing MBTA parking that's along the south side of the project drive. Uh, the realignment cuts into that, the parking spaces there and would result in about eight spaces um, that would potentially needed to be relocated, uh, maybe further along the private drive, um, depending on coordination with MBTA. Uh, the second alternative that we looked into was maintaining free flow traffic on Ash Street, letting them free flow to the th eventual three-way intersection with Main Street, uh, teeing up Bolton Street here to meet the private drive at a uh, T three-way intersection. Um, then the private drive would then come down and meet and tee up with Ash Street prior to Main Street. Um, this would allow us to keep the existing MBTA parking spaces as they are today. It creates um, a greater distance and a longer vehicle queue for the intersection of Ash and Main Street to the rail crossing here, reducing the amount of spillback that would um, potentially spill back into the rail crossing here. Um, you know, some of the disadvantages here, there are some impacts to the McDonald's parcel here. They have an existing two-way access uh, driveway off of the Ash Street here. Um, that would likely be uh, removed and eliminated as part of this improvement and the sole access and egress to the McDonald's parcel would be off of Main Street. Um, and there are maybe potentially some minor takings along this corner of the bank here, uh, but we do uh, have minimal uh, land takings for the MBTA parking and land in this area. So now as part of the longer term intersection improvements, um, the first two shorter term improvements, we looked into trying to avoid as, you know, as limit the amount of impacts to private parcels in this area as much as pro possible. Um, but after discussing with town staff, we, we decided that it'd be best to, at this stage, look into all potential options and not have any limitations uh, as far as what we evaluated. Um, so as you can see, what we are proposing here now is to uh, completely shift the uh, Ash Street alignment and basically tee up Ash Street with Main Street much further south of its original intersection location. This would require a complete land taking of the existing Jiffy Lube parcel at this location here. What this approach allows us to, what this improvement allows us to do is T, uh, create a four-way intersection here with Main Street and the car wash uh, entrance and exit here. Um, this would, you know, result in, um, would basically make this one intersection as opposed to two different separate intersections. Um, the vehicle com conflict points would be uh, reduced to just one location. Um, the car wash can be, from what we hear, a uh, particularly high um, driveway, a high volume driveway. So uh, team, uh, meeting Main Street at that location would have benefits there. Um, we would have all of this space here as new open space to provide landscape improvements, uh, additional green space where the existing Jiffy Loop parcel is today. Um, and then up here towards Bol Bolton Street in the private access driveway to the Market ba Basket Plaza, um, we would propose to tighten up that intersection as well. That is now just a traditional T um, three-way intersection with a shorter pedestrian crossing. Um, and in addition to the impacts of the Jiffy Lube parcel, there are minor impacts to the Burger King parcel here, but we are able to maintain 
um, the existing circulation. Um, we are able to maintain the, dri the drive through here and um, we do impact the circulation, um, but it is now one way. So drivers would come in, park here, they would have the option to go around the drive through and circulate around the uh, parking lot in a counterclockwise manner and exit via here. Um, the next long-term intersection improvement we looked at was a potential roundabout. Um, you know, this, this option here results in complete takings of both the Jiffy Lube and the Burger King parcels. Um, it will also result in minor impacts to the existing parking on the east side of Main Street that serves the Reading Plaza. Um, however, what this this alternative would allow us to do is improve safety at this location. Uh, roundabouts are known to reduce vehicle travel speeds in the area. Um, so we'd reduce vehicle travel speeds, create a much more defined intersection, um, reduce, significantly reduce the number of vehicle conflict points um, due to access management now along Main Street. Uh, you can see instead of the existing conditions, which has multiple various driveway openings along uh, Main Street here. There is now just one access and egress point to the roundabout, which then leads to an access road for these parcels. We do have some, um, we have an entrance only from Main Street prior to the roundabout for southbound vehicles that could enter into the car wash and enter this access road here. Um, and then the, the next access point to the south is um, south of the roundabout on Main Street. Um, so this does reduce the number of conflict points along the corridor, slows vehicle speeds down, creates a more defined intersection, uh, can increase pedestrian and bicycle safety uh, by reducing the crossing distances that pedestrians have, um, more visibility of pedestrians, increased visibility, um, However, the, um, the drawbacks to this, as I said, are the complete takings of the Jiffy Lube and Burger King parcels, um, the impacts to the parking serving the Reading Plaza. Um, and then while this could be the access um, characteristics of these parcels could be a benefit in the sense that there are now less access points along Main Street, it is also a drawback to these parcels um, as there are significant um, there would be difficulties in trying to maintain full access and um, getting the property owners to sign off and approve some access, uh, in, you know, their, access, their new access characteristics as a result of the roundabout here. And Jason, before you actually go on, um, I just want to mention that this section of Main Street is under Mass DOT jurisdiction. So anytime um, an intersection improvement project uh, comes to uh, review by them, uh, a roundabout has to be considered as one of the options. Uh, so therefore, you know, a roundabout is some, that's why we looked at the roundabout um, has a potential option because if we, if this ever gets forward, uh, goes forward, Mass DOT will ask the exact same question. So therefore, um, we came up with this alternative to see what would happen, um, how much impacts it would be, what kind of benefits there would be. So, sorry, Jason. No, thanks, Wayne. And the final long-term intersection improvement we looked at here um, was similar to alternative three, where we tee Ash Street up and realign it south of its existing intersection location. Um, however, instead of taking over the full Jiffy Loop parcel as we see here in alternative three, what we aim to do as part of alternative five was to realign it in a way that kind of use the existing driveway that connects Main Street and Ash Street between the Jiffy Lube and Burger King parcels. So such that we could, um, it does not require complete taking of any of those two parcels and allows us to um, achieve the same, the same um, goals along, Main, uh, along Ash Street. Um, so if we can zoom in a little bit here, um, as we can see, we maintain the existing uh, circulation along Jiffy Loop, so cars along Ash Street would be able to enter a one-way traffic flow into Jiffy Loop here, circulate the parking lot in a counterclockwise manner, and 
get back onto Ash Street at this location. Um, Ash Street does now align here a little further south of the car wash. Um, however, it is directly adjacent to the existing um, access point here. Um, we do also maintain access and egress along Burger King. There are some um, there are some impacts here, but it does allow us to keep most of the parking and maintain circulation throughout their parcel. Um, same similar improvements are seen up at the intersection of Ash or the existing intersection of Ash Street and Main Street, where we tighten the rate the uh, corner radii, radii up, shorten the crossing distance there. Um, what what these alternatives three and five also provide are expected improvements to traffic operations along Ash Street. Um, existing today, you have volumes from um, people that exit the Market Basket Plaza, the back way onto the private drive um, going towards Main Street. You have those traffic volumes. You also have the traffic volumes traveling along Ash Street going onto Main Street. Um, and any minor volumes that you would get from the bank and Bolton Street. What this does is this separates that up now into two separate intersections. So you reduce the amount of um, approaching traffic volumes that you get. So now um, at the inner, the, you know, the southern intersection here, you only have the volumes entering Main Street from Ash Street. Those are completely separate now from the, the other volumes that you would have exiting the back way of the plaza and from the bank and Bolton Street. So we would expect some um, you know, relatively, um, we would expect some intersection and um, traffic operation improvements to be seen along Ash Street. Um, so after uh, discussing these and going over these with the town staff, we arrived at a preferred at two preferred long-term intersection improvements. Um, alternatives three and five were deemed to be um, the preferred intersection improvements um, going forward. Uh, so as also part of our holistic study, we looked into the John Street corridor, which runs from Salem Street, just northeast of downtown Reading, all the way down to the Walkersbrook and Washington Street corridors. Uh, as Wing mentioned uh, at the beginning, towards the beginning of our presentation, this was flagged as a high cut through uh, traffic area, uh, particularly in the morning peak hours uh, for people coming along, you know, traveling along uh, route, route 28 here down to Walker's Brook trying to get to I-95. Um, so in, in addition to looking at the, the intersection of John Street and Salem Street, Route 28, uh, we also looked into the John Street corridor as a whole um, in, an, in an effort to see what potential implementation items we could do to reduce the amount of cut through traffic. Um, some deficiencies that we saw that we identified a high crash location at the intersection of John Street and Pleasant Street. Um, and then also the cut through traffic issue. Uh, so some alternatives that we looked into and um, some potential action items that we could implement along John Street uh, to limit cut through traffic is a do not enter time restriction during the peak hours. Now I believe um, several of the nearby side street intersections with Salem Street also have this uh, time restriction do not enter I think Eaton Street, Manning Street, Wilson Street um, have the do not enter time restrictions during the morning peak hours. Um, so this is something that we could implement along John Street as well. Um, in addition, part of um, part is of what we has been known to be effective um, in in an effort to reduce cut through traffic along cut through routes is to make the driving um, environment um, less, I don't want to say comfortable, but less convenient for cut through drivers. Um, this could be done, you, you may have seen speed, speed humps or speed bumps along these routes. Um, to make it a less convenient uh, route where drivers can just fly from the, you know, the intended travel route um, and cut through a residential area, 
um, to get to where they want to go. Um, so you know, we could we could implement uh, partly what we um, what we identified as a good location for a raised intersection was the intersection of John Street and Pleasant Street. This could um, reduce vehicle speeds, uh, increase the, uh, the safety at this intersection, hopefully reduce the, the number of crashes that are uh, occurring there today. Uh, and then in addition to raised intersections, we can also implement raised crossings. Um, and then also in an effort to reduce driver vehicle speeds, um, install radar speed feedback signs along the corridor as well. Um, and with that, that concludes our portion of the presentation. Um, I'll, I'll let Wing finish it up and, um, and we can go to any questions. Okay, um, Jason, if you don't mind, um... Uh, exiting out the controlling of the screen. Okay, oh, thank you. Um, so one of the questions that I could foresee you may have is um, all these improvements that we're talking about, how do they actually really tie back together in a holistic way? Um, I'm gonna go back to sort of the, one of the beginning pages here um, and kind of talk about um, this whole area in general, um, you know, we, we talked about Walker's Brook, we talked about John Street as a cut through traffic. So, um, but what are the improvements really meant for Ash Street, right? Um, so those who attended the Economic uh, Development Summit last year, um, certainly the town has shared the visions of what they wanted to have potentially down here at Ash Street, as well as a new crossing row and, and how that connection um, could be made in the future to really enhance this area. So when that does happen, the Astria and Main Street becomes even greater importance in terms of safety and operation. So we felt that certainly um, that has a huge connection from a holistic point of view. Um, then Washington and Main Street, certainly if, if this area is revitalized, um, that serves as an important connection again here. Um, then there's talks about potentially um, letting general way, allowing left turns coming out of general way. And if that does happen, um, it's possible that more traffic will end up using Washington Street uh, instead of coming out out of the existing intersection in Ash Street. So again, um, the improvements at Washington May uh, are certainly very important if you consider from that sense. So, um, so we did kind of look at that um, and try to tie them together, even though um, they may all appear to be individual locations, but um, we did try to really look at that and try to tie everything back together. Um, here. So um, with that, I, I guess I'll turn it back to Gene or Andrew. Um, maybe we can open up for some questions. I think we can open up public questions. Uh, again, please do use the raise hand feature that you'll find in the participants tab, and I'll be happy to shout you out and uh, get you going. And I already see a raised hand from Boreana. So if you'd like to unmute, go ahead, Boreana. Mm -hmm. Hi, thank you so much. Uh, so I have a question about the intersection, the first one, the uh, Lakeview with uh, Walkersbrook Drive. So I was wondering if you considered there like diverting all this traffic that goes to market basket, like uh, I remember having discussions with you, with Jean, so the new crossing road, which is the previous street before General Way, just by goes by Market Basket, but uh, I think it was just who owned the land or something. But was it considered so we don't get the traffic so far, like the traffic which is Market Basket traffic from the highway? Should it go that far to this intersection at all? Um, Gene, I can start with this one. Um, certainly, we, we talked about it at various meetings um, with town staff as having that as a possibility and really improve, improve the flow of the entire area. But certainly, there are some um, you know, further discussions and agreements that have to be had that's uh, probably even beyond the, the scope of the study. Um, but certainly, we consider that as a potential possibility. Thank you. Uh, can I follow up just one more thing? So all these things when you were saying somebody's property gets affected or so on, so this is also kind of potential problem, right? Where you 
we propose several like round uh, like rotaries and such i mean this is like you're just suggesting what could work but it's like they could be still hurdles uh because of like landowners not being on board and such um, that's a great point that you brought up. Um, usually when we do these type of planning studies or uh, con um, conceptual alternatives, we try to look at what would work best from a, um, uh, from a design point of view, from a traffic engineering point of view. Um, but at the same time, we really try to limit the, um, the right-of-way impacts as much as possible. Um, in this case, yes, some sort of land taking uh, would probably be best to facilitate, uh, say, for example, the roundabout um, here uh, for this particular option. So I would, I guess I can just take one example of this particular residential driveway. As you can see, um, the new roadway is going to get much closer to the building itself. Um, so there will be eventually um, some sort of right of way process, a property process that will acquire that piece of land. And um, yes, it's possible that the resident um, would object to uh, the particular change. So, I mean, I don't mean to belabor the point, but obviously, like, they heard those. So that's why I was, what they were saying, finding an alternative way to deliver the traffic to market basket, not affecting residents. I just hope it is being considered. I mean, if the, if the town needs to acquire the land through some, um, process so to me it's more logical to have that other alternative on the list as well understood understood and um you know um, we try to we try our best in, in many different scenarios that um you know what happens if traffic still has to come through this intersection um you know what if what if the residents are okay with the land taking um what if they're not right so um, you know, if we if we come back down to just a signalized option, can that still accommodate the traffic that we see today? Um, so we ran through all those scenarios in our head and, and ran some numbers as well. Um, so that's what we ultimately end up arriving at these two as potentially you know, best um, a balance, I guess, if you want to call it a balance. Okay, thank you. Next, I got Matt Holman. Go ahead, Matt. Hi, um, sticking with the same intersection, uh, as I'm over there as well, um, I would like to know if there was a conversation about aligning the general way with Lakeview in, in any way. Um, I don't believe we actually had that conversation um, realigning general way. Um, that particular option uh, certainly would go through all the, the wooded area which actually I believe belongs to the owner of the market basket plaza okay. um, so no we did not um, look at that particular option um, in, in our study because we felt you know we felt that um, again impacts uh, certainly that would need to require the uh, property owner to uh, give permission for that to happen um, so we're kind of looking at a point of view where, okay, um, what if we, um, uh, what would be the most feasible? Because if, if the property owner says no right off the bat, then, you know, maybe that option is, is out. Um, so what would be a fallback option? So we would kind of, um, the signal option here maintains that existing approach, but yet it will still signalize Lakeview um, and, and it will still try to balance the traffic operations as much as we can. Okay, quick follow up on that as well. Um, would, if in this signalized option, are you looking at taking general way and kind of doing anything with it to make left turns um, available? I mean, I live right off Lakeview. I have a lot of, you know, it's pain to go all the way out the other side or go down and turn around. Uh, I live right there, so. So this particular option, the signal option, does not to clue us or prevent us from adding a left turn, allowing left okay. turn. Okay, it does not prevent that from happening. Um, uh, so to, to answer your question um, in a short, no, it does not. Okay, do. okay thank you. And then I see Christos has his hand raised. Go ahead, Christos. All right, took me a while, sorry about that. No worries. Um, 
so being on the development side, looking at things from a development perspective, then being in the neighborhood, um, back to Boriana's point, there's a connectivity point on the mask market basket site with, uh, is it New Crossing Road? New Crossing Road, yes. That allows for um, some road access to that, which obviously is our design for handling traffic and also has a light in place already. At some point, if the town's goal is to continue to uh, increase tax revenue and look at smart development, um, all that vacant um, warehouse space by market basket at some point needs to be redeveloped. Um, and there's a path right now that whole parking lot with market basket is a mess, but there's ways to properly quite honestly, create a proper road corridor to get to, um, to get to um, New Crossing Road. So, and I think that would actually be pretty easy to do. So I would recommend uh, taking a look at that. There's a piece of property that I think the owners of the medical office building own that gives you that, co that connection point between the market basket site. And it's just a vacant lot right now. And the, there didn't be, there's no river, there's no wetlands, there's nothing. It'd be pretty easy to do. Thank you. Thank you, Christos. And next I see Marilyn has her hand raised. So go ahead, Marilyn. Hi, um, thank you. Can you hear me okay? I don't have my headset on. Yep. Okay, great. Um, I'm on John Street, and I'm very appreciative that um, John Street is being considered here. I appreciate your acknowledgement as it um, is a big cut through, and I anticipate it getting busier as the development um, becomes occupied. And so I do certainly appreciate all the efforts here. Um, I still need to take some time to review all of the options, but one of the questions that I had was um, in mentioning the small rotary um, I believe it was um, mentioned that it would prohibit large trucks from being able to access um, some of the buildings on um, Walkersbrook. Is that accurate? Um, so are you talking about the Walkers and General Way intersection? Um, I'm talking about initially when, and I don't know what slide it was, I apologize, um, where you were talking about different rotary options, and one of them was a smaller rotary, I believe, um, where Lakeview and John Street in that area meet, unless I misunderstood it. No, I believe you're referring to this. I, I believe I did mention something about that. Um, what's on my screen on the bottom right-hand corner, um, we did look at... Um, uh, a smaller roundabout. Typically, typically those are reserved for a local street with low traffic volumes. Mm -hmm. We wanted to throw it in there just to see what it would be, kind of an out of the, out of the box um, thinking, and see how that might work. Um, but we felt that, you know, from an engineering standpoint, that there's going to be too many conflicts with trucks, and they'll be driving all over the roundabout, literally, um, because that is allowed for these type of roundabouts, a mini roundabout. Um, and we felt that that might actually cost more in um, unsafe condition. Than mm -hmm. Yeah, because one of the things I've been I've been attempting to work on is a truck restriction or a tonnage restriction on John Street. Um, it was my understanding when um, Walkersburg was being developed, most of the delivery trucks and whatnot were going to be accessing um, those buildings from the highway. Um, but we do get a considerable amount of truck traffic on John Street as well. And I'm not sure if your study identified the how many trucks versus cars. We did our, um, I don't have the number right off the top of my head, but we did when we did the traffic counts um, for that particular day, the number of uh, large trucks. So um, as I said, I don't have that number at the top of my head, but we did count it. Um, I believe the number is quite low, if, if at all. I'm sorry, it, low? Yeah. Okay. Because we do have we do have some some large. I've had eighteen wheelers go by my house, um, you know, and, and it's just such a narrow little street that that's something that you know I just wanted to kind of throw out there since we're considering everything. And then also, have you considered the left hand turn at John Street and Salem Street being an issue 
and there's a lot of backup traffic from people attempting to take a left there. And I personally have been involved in an accident there. Um, and I believe there was a pedestrian almost hit on, um, on that intersection as well as somebody was attempting to take a left-hand turn. Um, so I don't know if that's something that was, was considered as well as being an issue with John Street. So we looked at that particular issue sort of from a different way. Um, so for example, we understand that majority of this traffic is cut through traffic. So instead of providing left turn lanes, um, you know, how do we actually end up eliminate them or reduce them significantly? Um, so kind of, I believe we're kind of approaching it from that end as opposed to how to make it easier for them. To, to make that turn. Because I, I believe what, you know, the concern that we heard mostly was, um, you know, how do we reduce cut through traffic here? Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's where our strategy was really focusing in on. Um, okay, thank you. Thank you, Marilyn. Uh, Tony, I see you have your hand raised, go ahead. Uh, thank you. Speaking of uh, the John Street, Salem Street intersection, I had noticed that when you um, use the, uh, the, the level of service for that intersection, there were actually two listings, one for the left-hand turn, which was an F, and I want to say A for a right-hand turn. Yes, let me bring that slide back to you real quick. Okay, uh, if you don't mind, I will just try to zoom in. A little closer here. Okay, so John and Salem is here that you're referring to. Mm -hmm. uh, the analysis provided for left turn lane um, on Salem, not the right. Okay, so it's, it's it's not two different ratings. It's one rating, but only for left hand turn, and we don't care about the right hand. Is what you're saying? Right, because um, actually the analysis would show that the right is um, basically would be an A because on Salem Street, there is no stop sign. So in theory, they have, um, they're, they're not restricted traffic. So the analysis would produce basically an A. Um, so in this case, the analysis really only looks at left turns, which um, because they have conflicting traffic. Yeah, I'm somewhat confused how basically streets with one lane, uh, one, one lane on each side can have multiple levels of service. Each lane has to have only one level of service is my assumption. Um, it, it is, but it also actually provides, it does break it down um, into the movement. So in this particular case, we're, we're um, looking at the movement. Um, there is, um, there is an LS for the approach, uh, but as I said, because Salem it does not have stop conditions, so therefore uh, we would only get the LS for the movement, if that makes sense. I would just assume that if somebody's taking a left, you basically don't have pass through traffic, so everybody ends up at the same level of service. But that's okay, no problem. Um, I also have a question about uh, some of the main and Ash Street. Uh, intersections. When you reviewed all the options, did you also take into account for tractor trailer traffic? Uh, mostly any tra uh, tractor trailers leaving the general way uh, plaza should be going out that back road, Bolton, um, it's not Bolton Street, I forget what the name of it is, but a good old Sanford Road. So really the left turning trucks that we end up with on John Street should be going out through Good All San, Good All Sanford over to Main Street and up north that way. So that that other one you just had with the little island. Uh, let me see. Prior, uh, one more. Had a little green island. There, that one. Yes. Would tractor trailers be able to make that turn? We do look at it um, in this particular case, uh, Jason, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe we ran it such that it will have to take um, uh, a good portion of the road to make that turn, but uh, we would still accommodate that movement. Okay, because that's the problem we have with the John Street uh, Walkers Brook intersection, where basically, yes, a truck can go, 
make the turn heading north, but they take up all the lanes right around the corner and many times go over the island even. Yeah, so under this particular option, uh, we do make it a little bit tougher for the trucks to turn out of there, and that is correct. They will need a little bit more pavement and, um, uh, to make the turn and, and not just staying strictly in the lanes to make that turn. Different would dedicate a left turn lanes. Oh. Yeah, I would say in, um, you know, the, the encroachment of a truck onto Ash Street as opposed to Walker's Brook, particularly in this scenario, would be uh, less of a concern. There's a lot less vehicles. So um, there are particular classifications of roadway that do allow encroachment for certain large trucks, um, which I believe Ash Street would um, fit that criteria in this scenario. Um, and, you know, we could do some we could tweak this alternative as well, where we show the, the green space here. Maybe we make a portion of that a truck apron and it's not all raised to um, better accommodate um, truck movements. That would just be for right turns. Um, but um, you know, these are strictly concepts at this point. There could be some uh, additional things we could do to better accommodate large vehicle movements um, down the road. And my final question for today is, um, the MBTA has basically right of way for three um, sets of tracks from the depot all the way down to the intersection on um, General Way and New Crossing, but they're not using them for most of it. Would it be possible to get a walking or bike path along those other two um, other right of way? perhaps separated well with a fence uh, to make sure nobody crosses over the train tracks. That would be a more direct route for pedestrians and bicyclists if they're trying to get to Quantipowit. I can um, comment on that one, Tony. That That is a great idea. And um, one that we've talked about for a number of years, we had a um, Main Street corridor study done, I think it was about 10 years ago. MAPC helped us out, and that was one of the connectivity um, ideas that was in that study. Um, having worked for and with the MBTA, um, I can tell you, I'm sure you're well aware, that it, that idea, executing that idea can be difficult, and I think, I still think it's worth keeping on the table, so I'm glad you brought it up. But, um, but it, it's, um, it's an idea that, that's, that's gonna really require some more work. And um, it, it's, a, it's a reach because um, the, the T is, is just a, a big place to, to try and get through and, um, and find answers to creative ideas like that. But I, I, think, I think your point is well taken and I think we should continue to keep that one on the table someplace, whether it's in this study or, or part of our other uh, planning work. Thank you. That's all for now. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. Does any other members of the public have questions or comments? Go ahead, Boriana. I was wondering about next steps with this proposal, so what do you expect to happen? I can jump in on that one. Thanks, Boriana. Um, thank you all again for so many good ideas. And um, I, don't, I don't know if Marilyn is a new hand, but um, we can certainly circle back. Um, but the, um, the, the, the way we see this going is um, we do expect to have another meeting and maybe um, I don't know if we've outlined exactly when that would be. It's the challenging world of um, virtual meetings, um, but we certainly want to um, continue this conversation and um, get as much feedback as possible. Uh, this has not been presented to the um, select board, which um, ideally it would be since they are the roadway commissioners and they ha are the decision makers on anything pertaining to roadway improvements. Um, but it, it's, uh, it's definitely um, a conceptual redesign 
and an, an analysis that is a starting point. And so I think uh, what, what I would suggest is after we wrap up the study and, and the rest of the um, public outreach, I think it would be um, very beneficial for us to continue to think about um, implementation. And certainly um, the, if there's any low hanging fruit, if there's any um, conversations that we can um, at least start and start working on them, I think we should and identify um, a path forward on how we might be able to go to the next phase. Uh, thank you, Jean. I just wanted to thank you for actually inviting us, including us in the process. Thanks a lot. Uh, Marilyn, I did see your hand go up, so please feel free. <laughs> yes, I just wanted to identify or ask if, um, you know, going forward, um, for instance, I know that um, Pleasant Street and John Street was identified. Um, I think the raised um, crosswalk is a great idea or the raised intersection is a great idea. Um, we may find that once the development is um, up and running, um, other streets such as the intersection of John and Green Street are going to start experiencing higher volumes than the raised. Um, that might be a good idea for those intersections as well. And people do tend to speed through those, you know, from stop sign to stop sign. Um, so I just thought I would, uh, you know, see if that's, you know, kind of thrown into the mix. Future, in, you know, unanticipated things like that. Absolutely. I think we'll continue to look at it holistically in any area of need as identified would be thought of and if possible we would move forward with. Definitely a good comment. Did we see anyone else? Well, seeing none, I think we can start wrapping this up. So I don't know if Jean, did you have any closing comments? Nope, I just again want to say thank you. And um, if people want to digest some of this and circle back, um, Andrew's uh, contact information is on the website. The presentation is on the website. So if you want to um, go to the, I think it's on the homepage now, right, Andrew? It is. Yeah, so you can um, take another look at this, um, give us your thoughts, digest it a little bit more. Thank you to the team from Green, Jason and Wing, and thank you all for taking the time to um, be part of this presentation. Good night. Yes, thank you. Thank, thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone.